Well, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you very much to Kenneth for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I was at the conference in uh, North Shipping and I agree entirely with Carl that it was very successful and also wonderful for academics to be talking with civil society, with trade unionists, with people who do the practical work. And I'm sure that what we are doing here today is a continuation of that effort to get out of the academic uh, uh, ghetto, if you like. Um, Eva said I would comment on the statistics. I just noticed this e EU statistic is on foreign citizens. Now, of course, at least half the immigrants in Europe are not foreign citizens. They've become naturalized. In some countries, it's very easy to get naturalized, like in Sweden and in France. In some countries, it's quite difficult, like in Germany and Austria. And so we really need three sets of figures. We need a set of figures on foreign citizens, which is the EU figure, a figure on overseas-born or foreign-born people, and a, f a figure on ethnic minorities, people who are in groups who experience some form of marginalization or discrimination. So never believe statistics. Statistics are political constructions. You always need to look behind them. But um, it would, I could speak for hours on that, but I won't. Uh, you're pleased to, you'll be pleased to hear. What I want to talk about to introduce this seminar is about the enormous changes in work, citizenship, and social relations throughout the world, not just in the developed countries, but everywhere really, which are linked to the neoliberal mode of globalization, which has been dominant since the 1970s. And of course, what has happened to that in the crisis of this neoliberal mode of globalization since 2007? Um, so that is my topic. And my central concept, if you like, which I will come back to many times, is the idea of differentiation. In other words, the idea that throughout its history, capitalism has not had a homogenous working class, but has differentiated between different categories of people in order to make some of them more easily exploitable. And I'll say a lot more about that. Um, So just to give you a very brief rundown of the history, I, I don't want to spend much time on it. If you go back right to the beginning of the, the capitalist mode of production in the 16th century with colonialism, you already find the division between workers who are free and workers who are in some way not free to compete equally. And there are many modes of this unfreedom. The most obvious one, which is complete unfreedom, is slavery. And let us not forget that the capital that made the industrial revolutions possible in Western Europe was accumulated through slavery in other parts of the world, through forcing Africans to go as slaves to the new world and to work on sugar plantations or on cotton plantations and then bringing that capital back to Europe. So unfree labor has always been crucial. When slavery was abolished in the 19th century, it was replaced by another form of unfree labor, indentured labor, which meant taking workers within the global empires of the period from one place to another so they could be more easily exploited. And when you look at the actual beginnings of industrialization in European countries, you find the free worker the person who is free because he or she has been chased off the land by enclosures, by the turning of agricultural land into sheep pastures or deer estates for hunting. Um, people were made destitute and therefore became free to make contracts with their employers. That is the idea of freedom. But they were also free of the means of production. Freedom has a double meaning. Um, and I think we should, I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on history, but we should understand that there have always been groups of workers who do not have full rights and who, on the one hand, can be easily exploited and, on the other hand, can be used to undermine the conditions of the rest of the working class. 
Now, before I go further with analyzing these issues, I want to talk about the recent economic crisis, or the current crisis, I think we should say, especially in Europe, and point to three curious results of this crisis in terms of migrant labor, so that we can think about that and then come back to it at the end. The first puzzle, if you like, is that the unemployment of foreign-born workers in OECD countries, in the rich countries, in other words, increased twice as fast as that of local people during the crisis. So the unemployment increased, but so did the employment. The employment of foreign-born people increased 5% in the same period, while the employment of local-born people in OECD countries declined by about 2%. So how do we explain that, that both unemployment and employment increase at the same time? Second puzzle. Migrant men were far more affected than migrant women by unemployment during the crisis. Why was that? And does that mean that migrant women became better off? And the third puzzle, the global economic crisis affected old industrial economies more than the newer emerging ones. Does this mean a shift in global economic and, mi and migration patterns? So those three questions I'll come back to at the end of my talk. So just to go back to this idea of freedom and unfreedom, if you look at um, theories of liberalism, and I don't mean neoliberalism, I mean going back to Adam Smith and to some of these classical theories, um, one of the great achievements, the great moral achievements of liberalism and capitalism is the idea of freedom, that everybody becomes a free and equal subject in society. And yet, as I say, that has never applied to all workers or to all people. And I think you can see labor migrants as unfree for the following reasons. I mean, it's not the same as slavery, but firstly, some migrants are forced to leave their countries by economic and political factors. So they're they are forced to go somewhere else where their labor is needed. Secondly, they are denied the rights enjoyed by some other workers or by most workers. And thirdly, they suffer institutional and informal discrimination. So what this implies is that freedom and inequality are not absolute categories. You are not either free or unfree. There are degrees of freedom and unfreedom. And these Differences, this differentiation process is crucial at every stage of capitalist development. However, I'm going to jump a few hundred years and come straight to the, the issue of what's happened since the Second World War, really two big stages in the development of capitalist economies. The first one is the boom after the Second World War, which was accompanied by a strengthening of the labor movement and the emergence of quite strong welfare states, certainly, as you know it, in Nordic countries, but to some extent in the rest of Europe, even in the United States. If you think of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program, for instance, in the 60s, very much a program based on a welfare state, even if that wasn't the name given to it. Um, in this period, of course, the problem was that wages were increasing, which was not very useful for, for employers. They wanted to keep wages at a lower level. And one way of doing this was to bring in migrant workers. All European countries, all Western European countries, I should say, because Helmer will jump on me otherwise, um, all Western European countries brought in labor in two forms. One form was the migrant workers, in the extreme form, the guest worker system, as used in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria, where workers were defined by their nationality, had limited rights, were not supposed to bring their families, were not supposed to stay. There was a so-called rotation principle, and they, they didn't have full welfare rights. Uh, the other form of importing migrant labor was what was used by former colonial powers, especially Britain, the Netherlands, and France, and that was bringing in workers from their colonies or former colonies. Um, and there is a difference in the way it worked 
because these colo former colonial workers were usually citizens of the so-called mother country. They had the right to come, to stay, and to bring their families. And here, the mode of discrimination was not legal status, as with the guest workers, it was racial discrimination. It was based on the cultures of racism that had developed in colonial powers over centuries. The result, though, is the same in both cases. It created a class of workers, a group of workers, who got the worst jobs, who were the first to lose their jobs in recession, and got the worst conditions. And the German employers had a, a wonderful word for this. They called it the Konjunkturpuffer. I don't know if anyone understands German. What, what it means in English is a buffer against economic fluctuations. It sounds better in German. Die Konjunkturpuffer. Um, and what it means is that migrants were seen as workers who could be bought in when they were needed and got rid of when they weren't needed again. If they were guest workers, they could be sent back to Turkey or North Africa. If they were colonial migrants, they could be unemployed in the poorer parts of British cities. Now, the Konjunkturpuffer strategy actually had a test in 1973. In 1973, the so-called oil crisis, there was a turnaround in European economies, a lot of unemployment, and the employers and the governments confidently hoped that all these unemployed people would go away and reduce unemployment for local people. And of course, as you all know, it didn't work. Many, many migrants stayed on in countries like Germany. They bought their families and they turned into permanent minorities. So the Konjunkturpuffer worked to some extent because migrants were first to lose their jobs and had rates of unemployment about twice as high as locals. But it didn't work in the sense of getting rid of what were seen as the social issues connected with migration. So let's jump to the, the current phase, or the, no, the, the phase before the current one, the rise of neoliberalism from the 1970s. And what neoliberalism meant was firstly a change in the global strategies of big corporations. Instead of bringing workers to the old industrial countries, the work was exported to low-wage economies, to countries with weak trade unions or lack of trade union rights, so that work could be done much more cheaply. And that made it possible to attack the welfare states in developed countries. And we have this, this Thatcher-Reagan period of the rollback of the welfare states. I think it's happened a little bit later in Scandinavia than it did in other parts of the capitalist world. Um, so we have capital export to new industrial areas. We have the development of global commodity chains where it becomes possible to break up production so that each stage of production can be done where it's cheapest, even using, say, family labor in India or um, factories in Southeast Asia where women work at microscopes and can only work a few years because they go blind after a few years, but for a few years they're very productive. You couldn't do that in Europe, but it could be done in Southeast Asia. And then the control and design functions get concentrated in the highly developed countries for a while. That is a passing phase. Um, and these new emerging industrial countries also give rise to new streams of migration. So instead of the migration into the old industrial areas of the previous period, we now have new migrations, for instance, to the Gulf oil states, to currently to Russia and other parts of the former Soviet Union, where there were oil economies, to East Asia from Southeast Asia, and within Southeast Asia to some of what they call the, the second wave tiger economies. Um, the ideology used to justify this by neoliberal theorists, people like Hayek originally, Milton Friedman more recently, um, Alan Greenspan, who was the head of the US Treasury, is what's called the Washington Consensus. The Washington Consensus had the idea of deregulation, small states, free trade, and what was called a level playing field. 
And the ideology used to justify it, to legitimate, if you like, this system, was that it might lead to inequality in the short run, but in the long run, because this system was highly efficient, it would lead to a convergence between the rich countries and the developing countries. Everyone would be better off in the long run. And so the, the ideology was presented with the addition of saying there is no alternative. This is the only way forward. And it was very convincing, very powerful for 20 or 30 years. How am I going for time? Okay. Um, part of this, this new move was um, a new global labor market, outsourcing of production, breaking up production processes, and in the developed countries, countries like Sweden, obviously, a change in the way people were employed, flexible employment, which means subcontracting, turning workers into small entrepreneurs who have to buy their own taxis or tools or work means and bear all the risk and are not covered by the insurance of their employers. Informal, informalization, employing people in dubious ways without fixed contracts in sectors like catering, retail, um, and care work. And of course, temporary and casual work, especially for women, youth, and migrants. And what this means is that the way people are employed no longer depends on their human capital, on their education and skills. It depends on those factors, but also on gender, race, ethnicity, origins, legal status, age, location, non-economic factors. And this is where migration comes in. Migration is a way of bringing in people who have a weak legal status. They are either there as legal workers, but with limitations, or they're there as irregular workers who have no right to be there according to the law, but actually have a place in the labor market and cannot join trade unions, cannot take legal action, and can be easily exploited. So, just a little bit of background on migration. Currently, there are said to be, by the UN, 214 million migrant workers, migrants, sorry, not migrant workers, migrants altogether in the world. Uh, the largest group moves from south to north. But if you look at internal migration, probably 700 million people in the world have had to migrate within their own countries, and that is mainly a south-south phenomenon. Um, the old industrial countries, countries like Germany, Britain, and Sweden, adopted zero migration policies. They had the idea that um, they didn't need migration anymore because all work in future would be highly skilled. They had an educated workforce. We know now that that zero, zero migration policy failed because one, on the one hand, there's a need to bring in skilled people to make education systems cheaper, to spend less on education in the developed countries. But on the other hand, there's a bipolar labor market. Um, young nationals in countries like Sweden and Germany will not do care work, street cleaning, uh, subordinate work in the catering industry and so on. So more and more of these jobs are done by irregular migrants or by regular in some cases. Minute. We will take questions afterwards, and uh, you have to use the microphone afterwards. But we'll take all the questions after all the four speakers have uh, spoken. Okay. Well, I'm running out of time, so let me just say there are different concepts for understanding what's happening. Uh, there is a, a, a restructuring of the labor market away from regular work to different forms of employment for different sectors, and we call what is happening at the lower end of the labor market precarious work, but my colleagues will go into more t detail on that. What has this got to do with citizenship? Well, when migrants came originally, it was extremely hard for them to get citizenship, but as uh, a distinguished uh, Swedish colleague, Thomas Hammer, pointed out, they got social rights, and he called them denizens. In other words, they, they had some rights of citizenship, but not all the rights. So you have that phenomenon, but you also have the phenomenon of people who are part of the workforce, part of the society, 
but have basically no rights because they are seen as irregular and not legitimately there. It's not a huge phenomenon in Sweden. It's enormous in the United States, 11 million irregulars in the United States, very large in southern Europe and growing throughout Europe. And this is something that we're, we've been very concerned with. It's a huge challenge to the labor movement because historically trade unions have only organized workers who have full legal status. So there are different statuses, different levels of citizenship. And the problem is, how do social actors like non-governmental organizations or trade unions react to it? At the meeting in Linköping, in Norköping, we heard if the trade unions don't adapt to the changes in citizenship and the workforce, they will be dead in 10 years. And I think that's an accurate assessment. Thank you. I'll stop. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you.